The Nobel Prize was a big event in my life. Uh, maybe it led to a change in my research. I, uh, since uh, 2013, I've been mostly working on uh, the idea of what I call narrative economics, that uh, economic events are caused more than most economists think by rumors, stories, uh, narratives we call them, which are uh, they're stories with a moral or with a interpretation and, and ideas that are contagious uh, spread through stories from person to person and change their economic behavior. I had heard rumors that I might, <laughs> so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a complete surprise. I was getting out of the shower in the morning, <laughs> of, early in the morning, planning to leave for a trip, and I get this phone ringing. I almost didn't answer, but I thought, well, it could possibly be the Nobel people, <laughs> and sure enough, they were. It was, it was a big, you know, one thing I did was normally a no-no. I went upstairs and woke my wife up. <laughs> she doesn't like to be awakened, <laughs> but I think under these circumstances, I did it. So that's how big it was. It was a big moment for me. A lot of people wonder, of course, where the markets are going. And uh, uh, is the stock market too high? Uh, is the housing market too high? Are interest rates going somewhere? Economists develop theories, but usually they're theories of rational man reacting to an environment that's changing. Uh, my uh, thought is that it's, it's usually not that. It's usually the people are changing, and this is what I call narrative economics. Shortly after I won the Nobel Prize, I was uh, elected president of the American Economic Association, which is the professional organization for economists, and I decided to uh, reform, in my presidential address, to give some reform ideas for economics. That led me to this narrative economics theme. Uh, that uh, economists have to listen to people more. Uh, they don't want to do that. They want to, they want to talk in abstract terms. But now, you know, with uh, online data, of, uh, we have newspapers, magazines, uh, books, uh, diaries, sermons. We have all these communications between people that are now digitized. I think we can change our research and become more focused on how people think and why that changes through time. My book, Narrative Economics, which I expect to be published in 2019, uh, that book has a lot of stories in it. Uh, they're not my stories. They're stories that I have discovered were popular at times of economic turmoil. And typically, we've forgotten the story. We, if you ask about, say, the Great Depression, we have our own story about it. The Great Depression in the 1930s is remembered by everyone, and we have our own ideas about it, but those aren't the same ideas that people back then had. People then were exceptionally afraid of robots, okay, believe it or not. Automation, uh, they didn't use the word automation. The word they liked most was technological unemployment, machines that replace jobs. And they thought that the high unemployment in the Great Depression was because machines were replacing jobs. Now, you may look at that and say, wait a minute, that's what we're worried about now with computers and artificial intelligence. Were they worried about that then? It's not part of our story today about the Great Depression. But if you go back, it was an important, I'm not saying the only story, but it was an important story that helps explain why the Great Depression was the worst economic catastrophe ever. And it also helps us try to understand what the risks are for another such catastrophe in the future. I've been involved for decades now on trying to develop, among with other people, behavioral economics which is economics that respects psychology, sociology, anthropology, history, political science. They're all part of the same big picture. And economists have been too isolated in the past. 
However, I think that that change has taken over much of economics. It isn't a, a battle to be won anymore. We have behavioral economists everywhere now, so it's the new thing. What is the next thing? Uh, well, I'm not about to lead an, a revolution again, uh, but I think that uh, one new strand of thought that is emerging now, something called neuroeconomics, and it's about economics which is respectful of information about the human brain, how our information processing works in our head, uh, and how that produces a whole economy. These are all new ideas which we can add to the toolkit of economists, but I don't mean to be disrespectful to traditional economics. We have to have many different approaches to understand such a complicated phenomenon as the economy. You know, my first thought, and this is a kind of a random thought, I would like to meet Jane Addams, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931, okay? The reason why I'm interested in her is that she essentially forecasted World War II on the basis of the attitudes people had at the end of World War I. She argued that the treaty that ended World War I was too harsh on the Germans uh, and too blaming on them, that it would encourage an atmosphere of revenge that could lead to another war. She did not live to see World War II, but I'm, I would really like to talk with her about how she knew, or how did she reach such a different judgment about, because I'm interested in forecasting, and World War II was a huge economic event. So how did she forecast that? Another example uh, is in physics. I would like to meet Erwin Schrodinger, uh, you can go on the Nobel website now and read his Nobel address about waves and nature. Uh, it's poetic, it's beautiful, but I don't quite understand it. So if I could go back in the time machine to 1933, at the time of his Nobel address, I would love to talk to him. Fortunately, all these Nobel Prize addresses are on the Nobel website, so you can at least hear their words if you can't ask their, them questions. Mm -hmm.